We've been talking about conservatism and liberalism in the class, but today our focus is on what do these ideologies believe about the economy, how the government, what's the government's role when it comes to economics. Conservatives believe in a more limited government. Um, they believe in limited government intervention when it comes to the economy. They don't want the government to be making too many regulations. They want tax cuts. So conservatives usually advocate for tax cuts. They usually advocate for deregulation of the economy. They don't want the government. It's not that the conservatives don't think the government should play a role when it comes to economics. They believe that the government has a very limited role when it comes to economics. And they believe the regulations that we have in place right now have become too much. Liberals are the opposite. They want more government intervention in the economy. They prefer higher taxes, especially on the wealthy population of the United States, because they can bear more of the burden. And they want to expand regulations, regulations like price control. Anybody know what price control is? It's the government setting a price for certain goods and products. Conservatives would say, and libertarians would say, allow the market to dictate how much things cost. If somebody is willing to pay $100 for something, then they should be able to charge $100 for it. But liberals are saying there are things that are essential, like for example, medicine. People that have diabetes, for example, need insulin, right? And a lot of companies, a lot of pharmaceutical companies, they're charging hundreds and hundreds of dollars for insulin, and some people aren't able to afford it. During the pandemic, people were unable to afford rent, for example, right? So a lot of liberals say, hey, the government should set a, a maximum price. They should be able to set a price for these products, not the markets, because people need to afford these products. Does that make sense for everybody? Right? A conservative would not support that, because that would be messing with the marketplace. All right. When it comes to economic policy, when it comes to decisions that government can make when it comes to economics, there's two types of economic policy fiscal and monetary policy. These you need to remember. Fiscal policy is something that we've talked about here in class. Fiscal policy deals with the government's ability to regulate taxes, either make them higher or make them go lower. And it also refers to government spending. Spending more money every year or spending less money every year. This is called fiscal policy, also known as the power of the purse. You should already know which institution of government controls fiscal policy in the United States. Which branch of government is mostly responsible for fiscal policy. The legislative branch, Congress, how holds the power of the purse. They adjust taxes, they, can, they also decide how much money we spend every single year. So it is Congress that is mostly responsible for fiscal policy. Make sure you remember that. So most of you know that already. You may not know that it was called fiscal policy. That's what fiscal policy is. It's basically the US Congress messing with its power of the purse. Taxes and spending, taxes and spending. Monetary policy is something that we didn't talk about yet in this class. Oh, by the way, when it comes to fiscal policy, which committees in Congress are very influential in when it comes to taxation and government spending? The Ways and Means Committee. The Ways and Means Committee, that's a good one. What's, what's the other ones? Especially when it comes to spending. There are committees called the Budget Committees, right? They are responsible the for creating the budget and the appropriations committees. Very good. So the budget committees and the appropriations committees, they have a lot of influence over fiscal policy. All right. Another type of policy that government can make that can impact the economy is called monetary policy. Monetary policy. Monetary policy is just that. It's messing with the money supply. It's about the United States currency. Monetary policy involves adjusting two things, adjusting two levels, interest rates and the money supply. Interest rates is the amount of money people have, uh, people have to pay for their loans, right? Not just the amount of the loan itself, but they have to pay a little extra. That extra is called the interest, and the government can adjust that interest rate. And they can also mess with the money supply, which means they can um, decide how much money right now is in circulation. Anybody know what these two economic levels, levels, levers control? What they control is the value of the currency. By adjusting interest rates and by adjusting money supply, the government can also adjust how much the money in your pockets right now actually value. 
they can make that value go higher or they can make that value go lower depending on what they do with the interest rate and depending on what they do with the, with the money supply. In this class, we're not going to go into too much detail because you don't know, you don't have to know um, that detail, but when you get over there in macroeconomics, hopefully Mr. Macambedos will talk about it more with you guys, but the only thing that you need to know right now is by adjusting these two things, the government can adjust the value of our currency. I'll give you a brief thing because I don't want you to get lost. Why are diamonds so expensive? Why are they so rare? Because they're so rare. There's so little of them, right? So when it comes to the money supply, the amount of money in circulation, if you want to make the American dollar be more valuable, what do you do with the money supply? Do you decrease it or increase it? Decrease it. You decrease it. You lessen the amount of money in circulation. By doing that, the government can make the value of the American dollar go up. If you want to lessen the value of the American dollar, what do you do? You increase the amount of money. You print more money and put it in the money supply. That would decrease the value of the American currency. Does that make sense? Interest rates also do the same thing, although I don't want to explain that right now because I don't have to. Does that make sense? Um, in that way, the government, with monetary policy, can do, can do something about a problem that we have now. What's the problem that we have now? Inflation. What does inflation mean? Prices are what? Prices are going up. The value of your money is not as much as it is used to. You don't have as much buying power with the dollars that you have in your pocket as it used to, as you used to because prices have gone up. That's inflation, right? So how does the government make your money more valuable? What does it do with the money supply? The government can decrease the money supply and that would, in turn, make your money worth more. You can buy more things even though they're more expensive. You can buy more things now because your dollar is more valuable now. Does that make sense? That's just the basics. I don't, I don't want to go into detail, but that's what the government can do. Who's in charge of monetary policy? It's not the president. It's not even Congress. It is an agency in the federal bureaucracy known as the Federal Reserve. Think of the Federal Reserve as a central national bank. Their job is to adjust the interest rate. Their job is to adjust the money supply. Their job is monetary policy. Their job is so important that the leaders of the Federal Reserve, called the Board of Governors, right? They're in charge of the, of the Federal Reserve. They're in charge of monetary policy. They're not even appointed by the President of the United States. This is a totally independent agency. Because their job is so important that there is no room for politics. There is no room for the President and Congress to exert some influence over them because their job is so important. So they're run by governors, they're completely nonpartisan. they're not appointed by anybody, they're, they're economic experts. They need to be free to make decisions according to their expertise. Again, they can adjust the money supply, they can adjust interest rate, and therefore control inflation. So that's what you need to know about monetary policy again. It's not Congress that controls monetary policy, it's not even the President, it is the Federal Reserve and its Board of Governors. Yes. Who gives a job? I'm not sure, I think they get promoted from within. Like, you say you get hired as a low-level person in the Federal Reserve and I think you just get promoted up if you do a good job. But I'm not sure about that. Anyone have any questions? Alright, today our focus is two economic theories that government usually employs when bad things happen when it comes to the American economy, like what could happen in the very near future because of what's happening now, a recession or a depression, like in the Great Depression. You should know that for most of our history, before the 1930s, the government had little involvement in the economy. The government did not try to regulate. The government did not try to interfere with the American economy. For the most part, businesses operated with very little government control. We didn't have the agencies that we have now, like the FDA, that didn't exist back then, that made these standards and regulations. For the most part, the US government, even though they had the power to do so with the Commerce Clause, chose not to. But then what happened in the 1930s that changed everything, the Great Depression. The Great Depression, the Great Depression is going to do, uh, give room for government, more government involvement. So the Great Depression led to more government involvement. 
because of what happened in the Great Depression, government realized that this cannot continue, that they need to put rules, they need to put regulations in place, they need to tell businesses what to do. During the Great Depression, FDR was the president elected in order to fix and help the economy recover. He had one plan, that is called the New Deal, a series of policies, a series of legislation designed to help the American economy recover. The New Deal is based on an economic theory that even today presidents subscribe to, some presidents subscribe to, called Keynesian economics. So the New Deal is based on an economic theory called Keynesian economics. Today, you're going to learn the basics of Keynesian economics. How does it work? Why? Because in the future, your presidents, your congressmen, might employ Keynesian economics in order to save your butt. So the concept of Keynesian economics is the government can make decisions to artificially stimulate a struggling economy. They can make decisions to artificially stimulate a struggling economy. That during times of economic downturns, like a recession that we might have later on, a depression like in the 1920s, the government can make decisions to kind of stimulate the economy back up. All right. Why? How? Through the use of fiscal policy. Through the use of fiscal policy. To review, what's fiscal policy? It involves two things. Taxes and spending. Taxes and spending. Taxes and spending. All right. Anybody tell, can tell me what's the biggest problem during a depression or a recession? What's the problem? No one can afford anything. No one can afford anything. The value of money is bad. The value of money is bad. So here's the main problem, right? Some people get laid off because um, of, of some businesses going down. So some people get laid off, right? So if I was unemployed, I'm going to be reluctant to spend my money because I don't have a lot of it left and I know there's not an income coming in, right? What happens if people are reluctant to spend their money? What happens to the businesses around them? They're making yeah. less profit. The businesses that um, depend on them spending money, they end up closing, which means the people that those businesses employ are now also what? Unemployed. Unemployed, which means they're going to be reluctant to do what now? Spend money. Spend money, causing more businesses to shut down, causing more people to get unemployed, causing more reluctance to spend money, more business. It's a cascading effect of crap. That's what happens during a recession. That's what happens during a depression. Maynard Keynes said, we can do something about that. What we need to do is have government encourage people to spend money. Those people who are reluctant to spend their money because they can anticipate what's going on, they should be encouraged to spend that money, saving the businesses around them and saving the jobs around them. And maybe create new businesses and create new jobs. So how do we do that? We do that by messing with fiscal policy. Here's my main advice to you all to remember what Keynesian economics is about. Remember what the goal of Keynesian economics is. Encourage consumer spending. Encourage people to spend the money that they have to help businesses survive and to create new businesses and to create jobs for people. That will stimulate economic growth. So use fiscal policy to encourage people to buy things. That's what Keynesian economics is. So, what do we do? What do we do with taxes? If I, I was the government, I want to encourage you all to spend your money so that you can save businesses around you, create jobs for people around you. What should I do with your taxes? I should lower your taxes. So tax what? Cuts. Governments should institute tax cuts. If you have more money in your pockets, you're, more, you're going to be more likely to do what with that money? And spend that money, stimulating the economy. Now we're good. But when it comes to Keynesian economics, they don't usually talk about tax cuts. That's an afterthought. This wing of Keynesian economics is the one you need to remember, that you need to associate with when it comes to Keynesian economics. What should we do with government spending? Because there's only two things that we can do. We either increase the amount of money government spend, or we can decrease our spending. Increase government spending. Increase government spending. 
stimulate the economy by ramping up government spending. How about that? So I'll give you some examples. During the Great Depression, like I said, FDR employed Keynesian economics. What did the government do? Anybody remember in U.S. history class? Exactly. During the Great Depression, government, Congress, and the President of the United States started funding public works projects like dams and bridges, canals, mall railroads, right? By funding those projects, what is government creating? Jobs. They're creating jobs. Government is putting money into your pockets directly. Why? Because they want those people to what? Spend money. Spend money, saving businesses, saving jobs, or maybe creating new businesses and creating jobs. That's what Keynesian economics is about. By government spending more money, funding a lot of these projects, it's going to create jobs and it's going to help stimulate the economy. Yes, sir. Sorry? I'm not sure if the, when the Uber Dam was built. Maybe. Maybe it was during the Great Depression, but I'm not sure about that. Alright, anyone have any questions on that? I'll give you another example. When I was growing up, we faced one of the worst economic downturns since the Great Depression. The Great Recession of 2008. You should ask your parents about it uh, because it, it affected us dearly. In 2008, the Obama administration, here's what they did. They ramped up government spending. What they did is they saved American corporations and American businesses by putting taxpayer money directly into corporations and directly into businesses that would have gone down without that money, without that influx of taxpayer money. By saving those corporations and businesses, they're also saving what? They're also saving the jobs. That's Keynesian economics. When, if you ever heard of the term bailout, that's what we did. The government bailed out businesses and corporations in 2008, saving the jobs that those businesses and corporations provided because they know it's a cascading effect of BS, right? If those corporations go down, jobs are going to be lost, people are going to be reluctant to spend money, more jobs are going to be lost, more businesses are going to be lost. So we have to save those big corporations. Does that make sense? What happened during the pandemic when people were reluctant to go out, when people were reluctant to spend their money in local businesses? What did the government do? Very good. The government ramped up government spending, and what did they do with the money? They put it directly into your pockets in the form of the stimulus check. Why? To encourage you guys to do what to it? Spend it and save the businesses around you, saving those jobs in the process. The fear was, because people are at home, and some people got fired from their jobs, some people are not earning money anymore, some of the businesses around them will close. Because of that, more jobs are going to be lost because of that. We might get into a recession or a depression. Some countries are going through that right now because they didn't do what the government did in here in the United States. This makes sense for everybody. So whenever they talk about Keynesian economics, guys, this is what they usually mean. This wing of Keynesian economics, not tax cuts, increasing government spending. All right, liberals subscribe to Keynesian economics. So it's usually liberal presidents and liberal administrations that employ Keynesian economic theory. FDR, President Obama, President Joe Biden. This is what they turn to during an economic downturn. For conservatives, Keynesian economics is a bad word. They do not like Keynesian economics. They generally do not support Keynesian economic theory. Keynesian economics for them is like socialism or communism, the government taking other people's money and giving it to somebody else. So conservatives don't usually like Keynesian economic tactics. Although, if they truly understood what Keynesian economics is, like some of, hopefully most of you guys in class, they would probably support a little bit of it, which are which is what? The tax cuts. They probably would support the tax cuts. But again, they lump it all together, and most conservatives would reject Keynesian economics. Any questions? Here's a problem that we have in the United States, right? Whenever we have an economic downturn, liberals want to fix it with more government spending, and conservatives want to fix it with tax cuts. If you're ramping up government spending, you need to balance that out with what? 
if you're spending more money, if the government's spending more money, it needs to be balanced by doing what? Sorry? What do you do? You increase the what? The taxes. If you're increasing government spending, you need to increase taxes. But liberals don't want to talk about that because that's unpopular. When conservatives say, hey, we need to cut people's taxes, right? They don't balance it out with also decreasing what? Government spending. Because a lot of the, po the programs that the government provides, the services the government provides, are very popular programs. So here's the problem with our politicians. Liberals want more government spending, but they don't balance it out with tax with tax increases. Conservatives want tax cuts, but they don't balance it out with decreasing, uh, decreasing government spending. And as a result, almost every single year, we get a what? Where does the money come from? We have to what? There's always a what every single year. Because we're either spending more money than we're taking in, right? Or we're taking in less money than, we, that, that, um, we're spending. There's always a what? What did I tell you? It starts with a D. Where does, the, where, where does the money come from? We have to borrow the money. What does the D stand for? Yeah, there's always a deficit. So both liberal plan and conservative plan can lead to deficits, if not balanced out. It can lead to deficits if not balanced out by either increasing people's taxes or decreasing government spending. Both options have resulted in an increase in our national debt. Our national debt right now is like more than $20 trillion. You have to pay for that someday. All right. Now let's talk about the conservative side. Conservatives, again, they don't like Keynesian economics. They think it's redistribution of wealth and socialism or communism, right? Their response to Keynesian economics is called supply-side economics. Last year, those of you that paid attention to your teacher, when I'm talking about Ronald Reagan, this is also known as trickle-down economics. Supply-side economics is a conservative economic theory. It's a conservative economic theory. But we have economic hardships in the United States. Liberals turn to Canadian economics. Conservatives turn to supply-side economics. Economic growth can be achieved by encouraging capital investments. Capital investments. Remember the goal. If you remember the goal of the theories, you'll be able to know how to achieve that goal. The goal of Keynesian economics is to encourage people to spend their money. The goal of supply-side economics is to encourage people with money to invest, create a new business, and thus creating what? Jobs. So the goal of supply-side economics, what conservatives want, is to encourage people that may have money left over, but they're reluctant to create a business, to create jobs, to encourage them to take that plunge and create jobs, invest their money and create a new business. Therefore, providing jobs for people. So the, the goal is encourage capital investment. How do we do that? So let's say I have some money left over and I can make a restaurant here in the valley. And if I make a restaurant, that means I have to hire folks. I have to hire waiters. I will be creating jobs for the people of the Rio Grande Valley, right? I will create incomes for the people in the Rio Grande Valley. But I'm reluctant to do so. How do you encourage me, if your government, to take that plunge? Lower. What do you do with my taxes? You lower my taxes. Tax cuts is one component of supply side economics. By lowering my taxes, right, I have more money left over, I'm more likely to take that plunge and invest my money creating. What's another way you can encourage? Remember what I told you when we're talking about conservatism and liberalism? Conservatives believe today the number one thing that slows down the American economy is government regulations. Because there's so many rules, there's so many standards that American businesses have to follow. People that might have the money to invest, they don't do so because they know it's such a hassle to invest in a business here in the United States because there's so many regulations, rules, 
regulations that they have to follow, so many standards that they need to obey. So what do you do with those regulations? You move over those regulations, remove them, relax those regulations, and if I know it's less of a hassle to create a business here in the United States, I'm going to be more likely to invest my money. So another component of supply-side economics is deregulation, removing some of those rules, some of those regulations, relaxing some of those regulations, lowering the barrier to be able to create a business here in the United States. And by doing so, more people with money are going to invest that money. So here's a question, guys. These two things, who does it help the most? The wealthy. Sorry, the wealthy. People who would be business owners, people like Elon Musk, people with a lot of money to invest, right? So another difference between the two guys is, I told you it's called trickle-down economics, is what conservatives say. If we support the people on top, if we support the wealthy by cutting their taxes, by deregulating their businesses, that wealth will eventually trickle down to everybody else. So we support the people on top, the wealth will trickle down to everyone on the bottom. What does Keynesian economics want to do? Bolster the foundation. Bolster the people on the bottom, right? And that would help prop up the economy. By making sure people have money in their pockets, right? By either spending more money or cutting people's taxes, the economy will survive because of it. All right, anyone have any questions? So let's review, because this is something essential for Thursday's exam. Keynesian economics, liberal or conservative economic liberal. theory? Liberal. liberal. And supply side is what? Conservative. conservative. Keynesian economics calls, what's the goal of Keynesian economics? How do we revive a struggling economy? We encourage people to what? Spend. Spend. We encourage consumer spending. What's the goal of supply side economics? In order to revive a struggling economy, encourage people to what? Invest. Create businesses in the United States. How do we do? How do we encourage people to spend their money? What do we do with their taxes? We cut their taxes. We lower their taxes. What do we do with government spending? We raise government spending. We spend more money. Make sense? That's Keynesian economics. Supply side economics. Again, the goal is investment. Encourage people to invest. What do we do with wealthy people's taxes? We cut them so that they'll have more money to invest. What else? We deregulate the economy. We, we, we remove some of those barriers. We remove some of those law, those rules, so that it's uh, there's a lower barrier to invest in a business. They'll be more encouraged to invest in a business. Anyone have any questions? All right, let's talk about libertarians. You all remember libertarians? They want very, very limited what? Government intervention. They want a very small. Very limited government, government service almost in every aspect of life, right? During an economic downturn, while, econ while liberals would say Canadian economics and conservatives would say supply-side economics, somebody who's libertarian would say, leave it the hell alone. The government should not be doing anything to artificially stimulate a struggling economy. For libertarian, the market goes up and down, up and down, up and down, right? by the government artificially stimulating the economy, it's just prolonging the inevitable. They should just leave the market alone. So libertarians would not favor any intervention in the marketplace, any government intervention in the marketplace. Although you would think they would be more supportive of what? Keynesian or supply side? Supply side, supply side right? They would say, leave it alone, leave it alone. It's going to pick up back up anyway. Sure, people would be struggling and maybe starving along the way, but it's going to go up anyway. Anyone have any questions? Let's go to the last one. Political parties and ideologies. All right. Do not confuse these two things, right? Political ideology is a set of beliefs, a set of ideas, like liberalism and conservatism are political ideologies. You can't touch them, their ideas, their values, their beliefs. Political parties are like private clubs, they're organizations, they're groups of people and that may subscribe to a political ideology, but they're a group of people. In the United States, the Democratic Party 
And the people that are part of the Democratic Party, they tend to subscribe to which set of ideas, which political ideology, liberalism or conservatism. The Democrats are usually liberals, and Republicans, that group of people, tend to subscribe to the set of ideas of conservatism. All right, there's this thing called the party platform. The party platform outlines the values and the goals of the party. It outlines the values and the goals of the party. If you visit the Republican Party website or the Democratic Party website, their handy for you is their platform. They're telling you, if you vote for our guys, these are the things that we want to accomplish. This is what the party stands for. Those of you that are going to be voting today, but you haven't done your homework, you haven't researched the individual candidates that you have the choice to vote for, this is a handy way for you to vote. Look up the party platform for each party. If you agree with the Republican Party more, then you should probably vote all Republican across your ballot. If you agree with the Democrats more, then vote Democrat across the ballot. It's a way to simplify your choice. That's not a good way. You should probably research every single individual. But this is uh, for those of you who are lazy to do that. All right. The Republican Party platform is filled with conservative ideas, while the Democratic platform is filled with the liberal ideas. Everybody should know that. So if you know conservatism, then you know what the Republican Party is about. If you know liberalism, then you know what the Democratic Party is about. All right, party identification is the party you label, an individual label himself as. The party that he labels himself, that he identifies with. If you think you're a Republican, your party identification is Republican. If you vote Democrat, then your party identification is Democrat. Easy. On your exam, here's what you need to remember. On your exam, you need to know which groups of people, which demographics tend to be Democratic, and which groups of people tend to be more um, Republican. So let's talk about gender. Anybody know, when it comes to gender, women and men, which one is more likely to vote Democratic? Which one is more likely towards the liberal side? Women. Women. We're going right down women. Women tend, by a significant amount, women tend to be more Democratic. They tend to be more liberal. Why? What are some values and ideas that liberalism is very attractive to women? Abortion is the number one issue that a lot of women agree with the liberals with, with the Democrats with. Affirmative action is something that they subscribe to as well because of some affirmative action programs help women. Women's rights, like sexual harassment laws and, and payment equality, equal pay for equal work, these are things that Democrats today support. That's why women in the United States, they tend to gravitate towards that party significantly. It's so significant that we have a name for the phenomenon called the gender gap that will be asked on Thursday's exam. We have something called the gender gap. Women in the United States significantly uh, tend to vote Democrat than Republican. Men are, are more likely to vote Republican, but very slightly so. Very slightly so. It's the women that you need to remember that are more Democratic. When it comes to race, which race do you think would be more democratic? Minorities. Minorities. Minorities tend to be on this side. African Americans have stayed loyal to the Democratic Party ever since the 1960s Civil Rights Movement. They've stayed loyal to the Democratic Party. Hispanic Americans, the Democrats used to be able to count on you guys, but recently more and more Hispanic Americans are going voting for the red side or the Republicans. But minorities, majority, uh, most of the time, vote Democratic. White people vote Republican more often than not. When it comes to income level, uh, poor people, the poorer you are, the less wealthy you are, the more likely you are to vote Democrat. So things like government regulation, housing, affirmative action, these are things that People who don't have a lot of money, they gravitate towards who when it comes to the Democratic Party. Wealthier people, the more money you have, the more money, the more likely you are to vote Republican. So I want you to see that, right? Conservatism is called conservatism because they don't like change. If you're someone in society that has a good, like males and whites in the United States, right? Wealthy people in the United States, then you don't want a lot of what? Change. You don't want a lot of change because you already have a good. So you're going to tend towards the conservative side. But if you're a minority, if you're a woman, if you're poor, right, you want things to change because you have a lot of problems. So you're going to tend towards the what? The liberal side. 
because that's the side that wants more changes. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. When it comes to marital status, it doesn't really matter. So if you put an X on those, that doesn't matter for, for us. Employment matters. If you're a blue collar worker, like a factory worker, for example, if you have an everyday job, you're more likely to become a liberal, you're more likely to vote Democratic. White collar workers, people that work in corporations, employers and businesses, or businessmen, people that have, that have people that they uh, that work for them, right? employers and businessmen, they tend to be more um, Republican because again, Republicans don't want regulation on businesses, they prefer tax cuts on businesses and corporations, so they tend to be on that side. When it comes to religion, you should probably already know this, the more religious you are in your convictions, the more likely you vote for what? You're more likely to be conservative, which means you're going to be more likely to vote Republican or Democrat? Republic. So the more religious you are, the more likely you are to be a Republican. In fact, the Republican Party depends on the Christian evangelical vote a lot, because they usually vote Republican. So things like abortion and their anti-gay marriage stance, anti-transgender rights, they're more likely to vote on that side. The less religious you are, right, the more likely you are to be Democratic. The more likely you are to join the Democratic Party. Hopefully that's self-explanatory. The region of the country that you live in also affects your party membership. Um, usually, people that live in the northeast of the United States, like New York, the New England states, Maine, Vermont, they tend to be more democratic. Anybody know what the W stands for? The west coast of the United States. California, Washington, Oregon, these are liberal states, these are democratic states. Usually they vote for the Democrat in every presidential election. And number three, was the use right? Texas, most of our state is very Republican, very conservative, right? Except for a few pockets, like the Rio Grande Valley, for example, where uh, liberalism thrives more. What is the use then? Urban, urban area, urban area, cities, like Austin, for example, super liberal. Those of you that are gonna go to university in Austin, you're gonna see that as a more liberal part of our state. All right, anybody know what this one stands for is on the South, Republican South, side, South. the South. Especially if you're a former uh, Confederate state, you're probably going to vote Republican. And the middle of America, Midwest. The Midwest, the middle of America, they tend to be more uh, conservative, they tend to be more Republican. Age group, this one should be easy also. The younger you are, the more likely you vote for Democrat or Republican. Likely you are to be Democrat. If I take a poll right now of what are you guys are, Democrat or Republican, I guarantee I'll get more Democrat than Republican, right? Alright. Again, the older you are, especially older people, they tend to be more um, Republican. Union membership. If you are a part of a workers' organization, if you're a part of a union, you're more likely to vote Republican. So if you're a member, you, I'm sorry you're more likely to vote Democrat. If you're a member, you're more likely to vote Democrat. If you're a non-member, you're more likely to vote Republican. Because if you're a union worker, right, you want more laws, you want more regulations on businesses to protect your income, to protect your workplace. But when it comes to which of these factors is the best predictor of which party you're gonna be in, you're gonna join, you're gonna vote for, it is this one. Don't forget this, that's why there's a star on it. It's gonna be asked on the test on Thursday. Parental politics. Democrats tend to raise Democratic kids. Republicans tend to raise Republican kids. So if I wanted to know how you're gonna vote for next year, all I have to do is probably look at who your parents voted for and I can make a pretty good prediction. That's the best predictor. Next is education. The higher your education level, like if you have a PhD or you have a graduate degree, for example, the more likely you are to be liberal, the more likely you are to be Democrat. You're going to see this next year when you guys go into college, a lot of your professors are going to be liberal, liberal. a lot of them are going to be Democratic, and you're going to see they're very open about their opinions in college. The opposite is true. The less education you have, Let's say you don't have a college degree, maybe you only graduated high school, maybe you didn't graduate high school, 
you're more likely towards the Republican side. So I'll give you a freebie of what questions will look like regarding this. They're going to give you an individual, and then you're going to have to determine whether or not that individual is more likely to be a Democrat or more likely to be a Republican. So for example, an African American woman with a college degree, Democrat or Republican? Probably a Democrat. A white Southerner who goes to church every week? Probably a Republican. Does that make sense? That's what they're going to ask you on, on your exam. All right, next. Because most American politicians are either liberal or conservative, there's a constant clash between liberalism and conservatism. There's a constant clash of ideals. Most of our politicians, especially in the US government, are either Republican or Democrat. So liberalism and conservatism, and those ideals are always at odds. And like Bruder said, that constant clashing of opinion, what will it do to the government? Slow it down. It will slow it down. That clash can lead to gridlock. Right now, guys, the Democrats enjoy a unified government, right? Presidency is democratic. Both houses of Congress are also democratic. But today, if you believe the polls, that's going to change. Almost 90% the Republicans will take control of the House of Representatives today, and they're likely to take control of the Senate as well. So by today, tomorrow, or this time tomorrow, we might see a divided government again, which means policies, laws, everything is going to get harder to be made because there's those conflicting ideologies, liberalism and conservatism, are going to have the clashing that we just talked about. Whichever party is in control gets to make the policies. Whichever party is in control gets to make the policies. For over two years now, the Democrats, because we had a unified government, were able to um, pass these policies, make these decisions very relatively easy. All right, last thing today, we'll talk about participation versus non-participation. It's supposed to be, guys, that the policies that our government makes should reflect the will of the people, right? That's what this country was founded on. But that's not always the case. It's not about it's not about everybody. It's about the people that actually participate. If you don't vote tomorrow, even though you have the ability today, even though you have the ability to vote today, then you don't count. That voice doesn't count. Policies don't usually reflect the will of the people, they reflect the will of those that participate. So policies sometimes don't reflect the will of the people, they usually reflect the will of those that participate. Like when it comes to college tuition, when it comes to gun control, right? That's the will of the people, yet we don't have them. Because people like you do not participate usually. All right, let's go over this together. To know which in our country is more likely to participate or less likely to participate. Um, when it comes to gender, can anybody guess who's more likely to go, more likely to protest, more likely to be political active? Gender. Women. Women are more likely to participate. Marital status, um, who's more likely to participate? People who are married or people who are single? More likely to participate? Who has more at stake? Oh, oh, people with family, right? People with a mortgage, so they're more likely to participate. Married people, single people are less likely to participate. This is the one they're probably going to ask you. Age group. Who's more likely to participate? The younger people or the older people? Older. The older people. When it comes to age demographics, people like you, 18 to 25, are the least likely to participate in the United States. That's why your voice don't get hurt. Education level, who's going to be more likely to participate? People with high education level or low education level? High. The more you know, the more likely you are to be uh, participatory. So high education level. Economic class, who's more likely to participate? Wealthy people or poor people? Uh, in the United States, it's usually the wealthy. The wealthier you are, the more likely you are to participate. The poorer you are, the less likely you are to participate. Make sense so far? Union or interest group, if you belong to a group like a union or an interest group, 
you are more likely to participate because they make you participate. They encourage your group makes you participate. If you're not a member, then you're less likely to participate. And any questions? Yes. Uh, something that I didn't add on here, when it comes to race, who's more likely to participate, minorities or whites? Whites. Whites, whites are more likely to participate. Whites are more likely to participate. Generally, more likely to participate. All right, this is a word everyone here should know before you leave my class today. That's why I don't know, that's why it's star. Political efficacy is the belief that I can make a difference. My one vote, my participation, my protesting, my colleague or my congressman can make a difference in the policy and the decisions that my government makes. That's what political efficacy means. The belief that an individual can influence policies by his participation by his participation. Some of you have a high sense of efficacy. You believe that you can make a difference. You believe that voting, you believe that protesting, you believe by sharing something in social media, you can affect the, uh, the decisions that the government makes, the policy the government makes. Some of you may be more cynical, or maybe you have a lower sense of efficacy. Those of you that believe, oh, my vote doesn't count, you have a lower sense of efficacy. What does that mean? If you have a high sense of efficacy, you're more likely to participate or less likely to participate. You're more likely to participate because you believe your participation can make a difference. However delusional that might be, you believe that you can make a difference. Those of you that have low sense of efficacy, that you're likely to be, you're less likely to participate because you're more cynical about government and politics. All right, your job tonight. If you haven't turned in essay number one, you have one more chance to correct. And those of you that don't have your money yet, make sure you have something for me tomorrow. If you're having trouble with these, come in the morning and try to help you. Essay number two, you got three chances to correct. Oh, okay. I'm not sure. All right. Also, um, if you have if you have been absent, make sure you do your head puzzles that you missed. Most of you have been here. Uh, but those of you who have been absent, make sure that you do your guys' puzzles that you missed. Tonight, um, your focus is on the homework quizzes that I assigned you all. Corrections and these homework quizzes right here. These are going to be very similar to what you're going to see on your exam on Thursday. This is going to be due on Thursday morning. These you can take over and over again. Once you submit it, they'll send you an email with your grade and the questions you got wrong. So based on those, you can go ahead and turn it in and get a better grade. Here's an important thing. If by the time Thursday morning, when you take your test, you have an A on these, oh, somebody to turn it out. if you have an A, ignore the answer. If you have an A on these, I will give you bonus points on your exam on Thursday. So if you get an A, I'll add more points on your exam. Okay, so mostly multiple choice. So again, they're due Thursday morning. We don't have a lot of quiz grades yet this um, six weeks, so they do count for a lot to so make sure that you do that. Especially those of you that have been exempting, 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 then you don't have a lot of quiz grades yet, so they will count for a lot. Good.